Hey everyone, it's me again. You know, you can't get this in me, can you? <laughs> but anyway, I've got a great show tonight. Of, uh, I've got the man of music on, uh, Derek Shelmity. If you don't know, you know the way we get, like, you're trying to think of memories, you know, and music, and you can't think of the song or anything. And uh, you wonder who's in the band, or you wonder who it is. You singing that song you forgot who it is. This man knows it all. And uh, he's got a fantastic book out. And it's called Rock and Roll Unraveled. Rock and Roll Unraveled. I think it's, I, I hope I've got it right. <laughs> I always forget the bloody title. <laughs> it's real terrible. Oh, I've got it here somewhere. I've got it. Well, it's like an, an encyclopedia. And um, it's absolutely fantastic. It really is. Gives you all the bands, all the, everybody, everything about it. You know, how he forms and everything else. But anyway, uh, I've got him on. That's Derek Shelmerdy. And I've got my mate, the international artist with me. Uh, he's, he's, he's just great. Great fella. Great friends. His lovely wife, Lainey, and all the mad kids that he's got, like my my kids as well. They're all friends, we're all good friends. And uh, that's Anthony Brown, of course. And uh, I've got I'll just before I bring them on, I just want to give the uh, give out the sponsors of the show, and that's Gap Painting Services. Now Gap Painting Services are wonderful. They really are. And what you've got, you've got these lads who at all times served, they're fully insured, they're very reasonable as well, and more reasonable is this, that if you're an NHS worker, if you're an OAP, you get special discounts as well, so get these lads in, the thing will come up, you know, it will come up, uh, how to get in touch with them, anyway, you know, they're, they're the sponsors of the show, and believe you me, they are brilliant first class believe me on that and before i go to be wonderful guest i'm just going to read out this and it's mary stan now mary stan is from um Cro not Croatia, montenegro montenegro and it's she says uh hello frank i haven't been joining last week Early start doesn't match with your right time, night time events. An idea, why not have one of these on late afternoon, early evening, international, with, and she hasn't finished, or he hasn't finished, I don't know whether it's a, Mari, I don't know whether it's a fella, Montenegro, or a lady, I just don't know. Uh, maybe he, she, can let me know if it's male or female you see uh, so yeah um I, i'd have to ask everybody you know my panel i have panels you see uh, at different times so i'd have to ask them if they'd like it in an afternoon one of them in an afternoon so you know that, that it's very important mary it's very important not not, not just for me but for it you know, the panel, the lads on the panel. Uh, Tony LFC. Hello, Frankie. Your ball's well, mate. See that? See that? Pint and a scotch. They must think I'm an alcohol. And uh, roll, me up, roll me one up, fat boy. He's Frankie. Frank's wearing our sponsor tonight. <laughs> it's the only thing I can find, to be honest. And John Conway. Hi, Frank, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm fine. Won't be tomorrow night, by the way. Got the football show on. <laughs> it's going berserk. Berserk. But anyway, I've got two very smoothing men. Two friends. on with me tonight. One. Derek Shelmer's in, unbelievable man. He knows everything about music. 
and also our wonderful Anthony Brown. I'm here, dear. Jerry. Evening, Jerry. Hi, Frank. Oh. <laughs> yes, I, I, I realised as soon as I opened my mouth. <laughs> well, good to see you again. Oh, and you, and you, Jerry. I got it right, didn't I? Rock and roll unraveled. You're absolutely right. I've yeah, been practicing that all day. This one I made earlier. <laughs> It is. I'm. I'm just saying to the people, it's absolutely amazing. My uh, bookshelves. It's a big. It's been everywhere. I've got bloody watches there. I've got files. I've got everything. You know what I mean? And I, I, I just can't put my hands on it. I really can't. But it's brilliant. And you know, for the viewers and the listeners out there, get a grip of this. He'll tell you anyway about uh he'll tell you anyway about the uh, you know how to get it how to get it i'm sorry i i, I keep stuttering I'm, I'm thinking of things that are going on in my mind and, and mikey lee says hello frank getting back in the groove hope you're well thank you yes and gary rigby evening frank and derek hi that lovely and I'm going to bring in this man. Love this man as well. If I was a woman, I'd marry the Perius and be a big <laughs> That'd be and, fun. Um, I think, I think, I think uh, Lady has had something to say to that anyway. <laughs> well, she's had a laugh anyway. <laughs> Evening, Jerry. Evening, Frank. Evening, guys. Evening, everyone. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? <clears throat> and even Tony says hello Derek mate, thank you as well and and funny oh, yeah. enough uh, yeah. Derek's book looks a great read and yeah, thank you it is, do, do me a favour Derek before we go on to the, what we're going to talk about okay. can you just give a little insight into your book yeah I mean it, it, it looks pretty daunting but it's dip in, dip out, it's in three parts, the the centre is, it, it happened, I mean, I'm sure you can't read this, but the centre part is it happened today, so 1st of January through 31st of um, December. Then that's all cross-referenced into what I call um, a timeline. So it gives chronological order to, like, every event is there. And what's great about that is you can read between rock and roll's lines. You can see genres and careers ebbing and flowing. I mean, you can certainly see the golden age of rock and roll fading away um, at the end of the 19th. 50s and then it's cross-referenced again into what i call pocket histories so then you've got um you know again every every item in there I, a beatles story or if the beatles are mentioned in somebody else's story um that appears then in the uh, pocket history so you know you can build up quite a picture and the idea of the book is, is very much for sort of drilling down I mean, you know, you start with, with, with somewhere. People often, the first thing they look for is what happened on my birthday. Um, but then, you know, you, you can actually uh, drill down onto, um, onto something else from there. And it tells the story of rock and roll from its roots. So it goes back to the Robert Johnsons of the world before, actually. Um, and really, uh, fin well, finishes in a sense with, the, with uh, punk. Um, I had to finish it somewhere. And I thought with uh, British punk in the... Um, late, mid, late 1970s, uh, rock and roll really turned full circle. You know, we'd been through the whole prog thing um, with uh, virtuoso guitarists, 20 minute drum solos. And uh, punk was very much a reaction to this. And it, it brought the music back to um, small venues, three minute songs, people who uh, weren't necessarily, you know, classically trained. And, you know, one of the slogans then was what? One was never trust a hippie. Um, and the other was, you know, anybody can uh, can be in a band. But what I decided was that uh, there are important things that happened after, like the Pink Floyd's uh, wall concerts and various other things. So I gave myself this rule that um, if an, an artist or a band had actually started before that cutoff date of the uh, beginning of February, uh, when the Sex Pistols played their last gig in uh, San Francisco, 
um, then they could be included. Because I was particularly keen to include Def Leppard, uh, because that, that was the uh, the band where the drummer lost his arm um, coming back from a gig, I think it was, in a motor accident. And the band stood by him. And it was it was several years before... Um, you know, he was able to uh, drum again with a, a specially uh, designed drum kit. Um, and they, they were rewarded with, the, they released Hysteria, I think it was, the first album um, after the accident. <laughs> and it's one of the biggest selling albums of all time, sort of multi, uh, multi-platinum. multi um, So, you know, things like that go on after. That's brilliant, Dan. Do you know when you first started off about, you know, your referencing and everything else to mm-hmm. like stories it brought back a memory for me being at university because mm-hmm. you know when you do an essays and whatever dissertations every essay that you do uh, especially dissertations mm-hmm. you actually have to write in you know the sources you know your primary yeah. sources you have to write in that and that's sort of very similar what you've done isn't it really yeah i put all the main sources in no, um, yeah, and I've been very careful to get permission for quotes as well, because <laughs> some people get very unhappy if you start quoting things and they haven't um, said you can. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you know what? I, 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 people use my quote as well uh, uh, because they asked me for permission because I said, historically, I mm-hmm. said uh, Liverpool was the Ellis Islands of Europe. And it was, yeah. you know, yeah. the way all the migrants uh, ascended onto Ellis Island, New York, you know, to yeah. you know, all the migrants. But they all descended here to get to New York. So yeah. I said uh, that Liverpool became the Ellis Islands of Europe, and I'm quoted on that. All right. I'm quoted on that. You know, yeah. so they have to put my name. They have to put Brad Pitt, you know, on <laughs> What did you think of that? Uh, you know what what Derek's just said, Anthony. You know how he did that uh, short synopsis. It was well, the first thing that comes to mind, and I know um, we've we've got our, our, our topic tonight. Was the wonderful way Derek, um, out of adversity, he's talking about Def Leppard and, and the drummer, um, and the comeback. If it was all or their their reinstatement of something, it's almost as if the public too had given them time to get together, and with that album, as you said, then becoming um, a, a, a global topper. It's it's wonderful the way music touches the emotions of people, mm. As, and without realizing, we're drawn to something because of those emotions, whether it be classical or whether it be pop and rock, which mm. which kind of mm-hmm. more delicatized um, thing, I think. But it's wonderful that that music or that ideology or what they, this band are doing appeals to people enough for them to say, I'm going to support them in my way, and my way is to buy the album. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> that's yeah. brilliant uh, yeah that's absolutely brilliant because music is the memories isn't it the yes. even do it with dementia and alzheimer's for, do for, it with everything. for us yeah if we were if we were to go somewhere tonight if someone were to pick us up in a cab and just drop us off in the middle of nowhere and there's three mm. pints three cups of tea or three pints and then music comes on the jukebox it would take us to a place on a time yeah. and if all the time, all the time. Yeah. I, I i remember a song and uh, it was goy orbison's and it, it's rather it, it's a juxtaposition between very funny and uh, i don't know can you say tragedy <laughs> in, in a word because i had this fellow he came to my house uh, I had to mark his uh, essay and I said, you better get it to my home. I said, so we gave him the address and he came down because he had to have it in the next day, he said. And he was well over. He's a lovely fella. He was a lovely fella. Still is, hopefully, you know, he's still going. And he came on his bike. 
middle-aged he was. And uh, he came in, and he was sitting there like that. And I'm marking away, and I went, are you all right? Because I always had music playing in the background, always. And he yeah. always had classical, but this night, as he says it just too well, well, late afternoon, I just decided to have some, you know, ordinary music on. And uh, he said, he said, Chris, and he said, I've just broken up with me girl. She's just left me. You know, oh. and I went, oh, I'm sorry. And all of a sudden, what came on the radio was uh, Roy Orbison's It's Over. Oh. <laughs> In the top. Brilliant. <laughs> To bingo. Oh, the irony. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's 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 music. <clears throat> it's like you know what what it's it's a soundtrack of our life, isn't it? Is, is music, and and it's we could all feel. Uh, oh, there's a CD songs we love, but you know it's it's like it's it's interesting point there, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure Derek is far more knowledgeable that you you kind of brought in a little strand there, where you you talked about classical, which is mm. almost about, like the godlike music, where everything comes from, um, mm. and there there have been an awful lot of of pop songs, rock songs, inspired by by classical pieces. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure many people aren't, aren't uh, aware. I'm, I'm painfully ignorant of the names of lots of classical music, although I love it and I put it on when I work because it's like um, it, it's like a mood enhancing. Yeah, it's, it suits you, doesn't it, really? I always played the classics uh, yeah. when I did my marking, you know. I, or, or, or jazz. I have a similar thing with, with not so much the likes of Charlie Parker and stuff, but more Miles Davis' Kind of Blue is mm. an album which I regard as almost classical music. And I'll mm. put that on and that will play all, all day. Yeah. And I, I, I just love it. But I totally get what um, musicians hear in it. And maybe a line, or, uh, I mean, even Paul McCartney has mentioned the Blackbird inspired by Bach, but I forget yeah. the piece, and, and stuff like that. And obviously we think of um, uh, White a Shade of Pale. Yeah, Procol Harum. Yeah. It love is, that song. It reminds me of um, One Summer, and I was at August. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it just every time I hear it, it reminds me mm. of some girl, and it was August. I just, you know, it, it's that memory that's there, it's etched for life, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Can, well, I, just, can I just read out this, this? Go ahead. What was you saying? Oh, no, all, all I was going to say is, is, is we're, we're very quick, quick with words these days. Someone who creates something um, like that, that impacts on so many people, that, that's got to be close to genius. Yes, yes. I just, wanted, uh, I just want to remind people as well, after Derek's song, I've got a great history show. I really have. I, I've got a cracker. So try and stay around for that. You'll be, you'll be surprised what I've got lined up. You really mm. will. And it's to commemorate something 80 years ago, you know, so it's something there to commemorate that. And um, when I listen to one of the stories, absolutely fantastic. But here's it, um, Gary Rigby says, question, <coughs> what is the best year for music? Mine is 1966. Good music came out before and after that, of course, but 66 is perfect for me yeah 66 an interesting year i mean it was a uh it's one of the major major landmark years in rock and roll history 66 it was basically when beat music from the first half of the 60s morphed into uh rock music we had was um 
at, at the end of the 50s, the Americans went off in a completely different direction to the UK. The UK's uh, skiffle bands basically morphed in, and rock and roll, British rock and roll bands, morphed into the beat groups of the um, early middle 60s. And then you have the uh, British invasion, um, uh, where the because of the Beatles, well, yes, mostly due to the Beatles, um, and they then dominated the American market. And 65, 66 was when both sides of the Atlantic came back uh, together, because what you had then of 65, 66, um, were people like Jimi Hendrix and The Cream uh, emerging on this side of the Atlantic, and the West Coast thing, well, West and East Coast, in, uh, on the East Coast, New York, yeah, uh, Velvet Underground, uh, emerging there, 65, 66. And on the West Coast, you had the, the whole uh, San Franciscan thing, uh, particularly Bay Area, where with the Doors and uh, Country Joe and the Fish, uh, Grateful Dead, and um, all that kind of music. And that really then was when, I don't know, arguably for the first time, rock and roll sort of fragmented because like 66, 67 was when, you know, Pink Floyd emerged and uh, Psychedelia uh, emerge, particularly uh, British psychedelia, very, very different to uh, American psychedelia. That was more, much more blues based, long, me Grateful Dead, great example, long meandering um, solos when they played live. <clears throat> but British psychedelia was much more about whimsical um, turn of phrase, you know, people like Sid Barrett, uh, you listen to the Pink Floyd's first album, you know, I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like, it's got a bell on. Uh, kind of uh, lyrics. Um, also then um, you, you had um, sort of hard rock uh, sort of coming out of, I think it tends to be called sort of hard blues at the time of the, um, uh, of, of, of Cream. That developed very much into, you know, your motorheads um, of the world. And then, of course, glam was just around the corner at the end of the, the decade. So, you know, and, mentioned Miles Davis earlier. I mean, he actually appeared at the 1970 uh, Isle of Wight Rock Festival, the, uh, the Jimi Hendrix one, because you had the whole jazz rock fusion thing uh, going on as well at sort of back end of the 60s. So the music was getting... Uh, rock and roll was starting to take itself very seriously, I think. And that really all sort of came out of uh, 1966. I mean, 56 is another landmark year. That was the year that Elvis... Uh, went from basically, you know, a local hero uh, to an international um, star. Do you know what, and, uh, what surprises me, Derek? It might, it might surprise you. I just don't know. I am even Anthony. Um, you know, the likes of Sinatra, for example, yeah. going right through the decades, and he was yeah. always going into the charts. Have you got any yeah. idea why? Well, I think you've got um, stars like that that um, are to the side um, of the, the 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 rock and roll scene, if you like. I mean, he he was very much, you know, the 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 crooner um, era came out of the sort of thirties and forties, and very much was what the early part of the fifties uh, was about. But I mean, these guys were just unbelievable entertainers. And I, I, I saw I lived in London for a while, and uh, some, he, he came to London. This would be sort of 80s, I think it was, early 80s probably. Um, and I've never been a big Sinatra fan as such, but, you know, the guy is you know, up there. I mean, to say he's iconic is an understatement. So I thought, well, you know, I had a chance to buy some tickets, so I bought a couple of tickets to go and see him. And, you know, without being a fan of his, the stage presence the guy had was unbelievable. <laughs> and what was quite interesting uh, normally, you know, compared to a rock concert, um, was two, three or four or five songs. Um, and then in between the songs, ladies of a certain age um, would walk down the aisle um, to the uh, to the stage with either some flowers or a bottle of Jack Daniels and, uh, you know, present these to him uh, pretty much in between um, each song. But, you know, and Sammy Davis Jr., I managed to see him as well. And the, the guys are just unbelievable performers. And, and they're very talented. I mean, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. plays lots of different instruments and he plays the drums, which is quite uh, rare. And I think, it, you know, they, they just operate in their own universe of music um, almost. You know, they, they just achieved a particular level and they're not subject to the sort of fashion changes uh, that uh, come around, particularly in the sort of pop world. 
you see so many interviews of the Beatles and the Stones in the early days, and they're always being asked, well, how long do you think it's going to last, lads? And they say, well, if, you know, two years, three years, we'll be very happy. Well, you know, 20 years later, 50 years later, you know, we're still listening to these guys. And mm -hmm. Stones are still performing. I mean, they're about to embark on yet another tour to support the, the new album that came out of uh, uh, Hackney Diamond. Uh, first album, new material for quite a while. That's unbelievable, isn't it, really, yeah. when you think about these people. But about the Rat Pack, uh, Dean Martin was my favourite. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely, honestly, absolutely brilliant he was. You know, a great entertainer, and, and he wasn't a, anyway. Uh, like, like a band, they were all individual characters, weren't they? So we talked about the Rat Pack, but ultimately, it um, um, on what comes across with pop and rock as well, it's the material, it's the song, and I think the 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 soundtrack that um, Sinatra and the Rat Pack and many other people, the jazz era, was singing, was so well crafted that it spanned generations, you know, and there was always a market for it, and it still is now, as we know, with the modern day Michael Bublé's and the like, uh, who are covering. Absolutely. The material that went on in the essentially the forties, wasn't it? And then you know, the fifties. The songwriters who wrote that stuff were, were just absolute craftsmen yeah. and women. And then we had a little bit of that in the sixties, but the the idea of of the mid sixties kind of waking up because people wanted a little bit more than um, a song about a yellow. You know, polka dot, whatever dress they wanted to think, and when you know the the Lennon was writing um, his stuff, tomorrow never knows, and which all mm. started to use poetry and and all that sorts of. Um, it felt like we were being informed. It felt like we were we were learning something. Mm. Oh, and some of those and we were actually. We were. Can, I, can I just uh, read out some of uh, you know these comments, please? Uh, it's just to greet you as well. Uh, DW, even in Frank Derek Anthony in live chat. Hi. Thank you, DW. Thank you. Uh, Soul Boy Fran, 1970 was good. Great choices of genre uh, rock pop, soul, Beatles, last album, more. Uh, yeah. Gary Rigby, Miles Davis, Your Bird Sweet is fantastic. The whole yeah. album, album he did with lounge music. And Lynn Ellis is to me the best music 60s and 70s. And carries on by saying, Derek, a double, double A side 45, same song, both sides. I had paranoid. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So listen, Derek. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to ask you this, but what will we going to who are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, what we look at tonight was some, some songs that um, made an impact, but to a great extent, I think a lot of them are, I mean, absolute classic, important songs, um, and they were very much reflecting the uh, the time. I mean, a lot of it from the uh, 50s, particularly the, the 60s, you know, time of the uh, Vietnam War, a time of a lot of serious rioting um, in America. I mean, may maybe that's a place to kick off with uh, Frank Zappa uh, track. Uh, but, you know, there, there are several very famous songs uh, associated with uh, riots or demonstrations you know when does a demonstration become a um, a riot and also there are some seriously uh, landmark songs um in the uh, you know progression of of music things like rock around the clock um rock island line and and the beatles i want to hold your hand um marked one of the most important um uh, things to to happen to to rock and roll basically surprisingly you know not one of the songs that you tend to think is a, 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 you know a beatles genius track but in terms of um the impact it had directly and indirectly and the timing of it because that was the song when capital 
uh, records in America finally decided to pick up their option on the Beatles. Because what happened when they were successful in the UK, George Martin uh, went over to uh, or contacted uh, Capitol Records, which was owned by um, EMI. Uh, but it, it was actually one particular guy at um, uh, Capitol that, that really didn't think the Beatles would sell in America. So they started off um, with a small uh, independent label called VJ, licensed 14 songs, I think. Um, and that produced four singles and uh, four, four and a half albums. Four and a half, because one of them was the Beatles and Frank Ifield live on stage. So one side was the Beatles, one side was Frank Ifield, neither uh, were live. And what happened was that um, just before the Ed Sullivan show in the February of 64, a um, couple of records released uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And, you know, that spent eight weeks at number one and was very much the, uh, you know, the beginning of the... Um, uh, the whole British invasion thing. So, you know, there, there are certain songs that, well, I mean, another famous one, of course, would be Billy um, Holiday's um, Strange Fruit, um, real, real landmark uh, song from um, 1939, actually based on a poem uh, called Strange Fruit by a guy called Abel uh, Mirapol. Um, and it, I mean, it's, this is really pretty harrowing stuff. I mean, basically, the word inspired is not really the word, but the song was inspired by a photograph of a lynching in uh, Marion, um, Indiana. Uh, it, it's only a very short poem. Um, and the first two lines read, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. And it you know goes on in a similar kind of vein. I mean, Billie Holiday, it's been released by a lot of people since Billie Holiday. I mean, hers was the uh, original version. And that really, I think, re reflects the very sad and vicious times that uh, uh, yeah. were happening in the Powerful. late 50s. Well, it's almost like journalism. Yeah. The song really wasn't it. And, we've, and Frank and I have talked in the past about the war poets yeah. uh, who would get out word of the absolute inhumane atrocities that were going mm -hmm. on. But they couldn't do it through a newspaper. So the war poets did it through poetry. And Billy Holiday did it absolutely majestically through yeah. through that one song. So um because I don't think us comfortable folk in England were were that aware of of the lynchings and the the racism and the atrocities that were going on in America, and I think, I think that's the beauty of of um, what you're describing with the certain songs, is that they inform us to go and read some more and check out what they're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the really interesting thing, or it still is, you know, researching shows like this or other radio stuff. Um, than I do is it's it's like any any aspect of academia in a sense you know the more you research something the more you know you don't know you know the more that you find that there is to find out and it, it's just fascinating because you know you, you you'll come across a reference to somebody or something for, from my point of view a song or a band or a, a gig or something that I didn't know was important and then you start to read up on that and sometimes you know so it takes you to a door and then sometimes you go through that door and behind that door, there's a whole room full of doors. You didn't even know the room existed, let alone the half a dozen doors in there. It's always leading off. It's fascinating. Yeah. Can I ask you both? Can I ask you both? Because, you know, you're the music, my seem to know it. Well, not see, but you do know everything um, about music. To be honest, and you want to be, you know, you're in a little band yourself. Do people really listen? You know, when when I was young, when I was young, uh, I just I wanted to be there. I wanted to wear the beat of the music, you know, mm. and that was it. And do people really listen to the lyrics, Derek? 
I, I think some people do. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at songs like um, Strange Fruit or, you know, it, it's worth talking about uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash's Ohio, uh, which is a tragic um, Vietnam uh, demonstration, stroke right, depending on which side of the baton you were. Um, I, I think, you know, people who like that, that sort of music will listen to the music. Whereas, you know, going back to the Beatles, I want to hold your hand. Uh, the, you know, the lyrics weren't particularly important. Uh, what was going on at the time, the stage the Beatles were at in their career, the stage that rock and roll was at of both sides of the Atlantic, were well, what was important. So I think, you know, if you're into, um, well, people like Bob Dylan, um, where a lot of the lyrics are just stream of consciousness, particularly in the um, earlier days. And I think he, he, he took great pleasure in writing lyrics that people tried to interpret, for which there wasn't really any um, interpretation. He had a serious sense of humour, Bob Dylan. I mean, he, he had a, a, a possibly uh, or probably a very uh, serious uh, motorcycle accident, depending on which view you read, even which view of Dylan's. I mean, Dylan has been reported as saying, you know, he's little more than a, a sprained ankle. Um, and it, other uh, reports, again, you know, coming from the source, uh, Dylan, you know, he, he said it was uh, really serious and he's talk of broken necks and backs. And you never really know uh, what went on. But, you know, you look at, um, well, you, you look at things like blowing in the wind, um, you know, the, the start of the <clears throat> uh, real sort of protest um, era. I, I think, you know, people who are into that kind of music will listen to um, uh, the lyrics very much. I think if you're into people like Floyd, mind you, Floyd do write some seriously good lyrics as well. Um, and, you know, th and their music is, is, is often sort of very uh, uh, seascape, uh, uh, musical scapes, basically. Um, quite, uh, quite amazing. Well, well what about, uh, you know, we're talking about lyrics, and what about that from Soul Boy Fran? What's going on? by Marvin Gaye, still yeah. relevant today. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting one, that. <clears throat> that's a, around the sort of 1970 mark, wasn't it? Um, and it, it's really very much all about the uh, the Vietnam War uh, and the civil, uh, civil rights um, struggle and movement. But what was interesting, when he actually uh, recorded that album, Barry Gordy Jr., who was the guy who owned and, and ran very much uh, Motown Corporation, because uh, they, they've got a bunch of um, record labels under the, the Motown. Uh, Berry Gordy was very reluctant to release that album. Um, uh, Marvin Gaye was very keen to release it for exactly the same reasons that uh, uh, Junior uh, didn't want to uh, release it, because he felt that um, he didn't want the Motown Corporation, Berry Gordy Jr., didn't want the Motown Corporation really to become involved in, in the politics of you know the Vietnam War and the civil rights struggle, he wanted to keep the uh, the, the company to the side of that. I mean, as it happened, Marvin Gaye got his way and it was released, and it's generally considered to be, well, his best album and one of the landmark albums of um, all time. I mean, interestingly enough, when you when you look at that, uh, rock and roll and um, soul music. Uh, the, uh, Motown started in 1959. Uh, Atlantic um, was the other big soul label with Stax. I mean, that actually started in the late um, 40s. And what they did, they, they effectively in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, they really morphed, uh, morphed a lot of doo-wop and R&B groups into um, soul groups. You know, there's a very fine dividing line, particularly in the early 60s, as to whether you're listening to an R&B song or a, uh, a soul song. And what's interesting is I think it had, uh, it doesn't get a lot of credit. I think uh, rock and roll and soul music particularly um, had a lot to do with bringing black and white kids um, together, you know, because they were performing in the late 50s, early 60s, a lot of places, particularly in the South, to segregated audiences. Um, you know, you'd have blacks sitting on one side of the theater and whites sitting on the, um, on the other, you know, never, twain never to meet. And what, what happened with, with rock and roll and with um, soul music is, you know, kids started dancing together and you find, um, you know, they're actually interacting together. There's a famous example of um, uh, Frankie Lyman, who generally considered to be the first black teen idol. He was about 14. Um, 
and uh, he was on a TV show, and the show was, um, I, I think it was, was actually terminated after he was seen. I think mean, he must have been live. Uh, dancing with a black guy, obviously, uh, dancing with a, a white girl. And there were severe repercussions, um, you know, loads and loads of complaints into the um, uh, into the studio. And I, I think, you know, it, it's understated how important, in that sense, rock and roll and soul music in the early part of the 60s were on, on the, you know, the social fabric of uh, what was going on, mostly, in, particularly in America. Not so much well, here. You know, uh, you know, you say in that about, uh, you know, segregated and there was murder and uproar over this, uh, you know, Frankie Lyman dan dancing with this white girl. And yet, it's the same people who caused the uproar, uproar that go and watch black artists. Oh, in absolutely. All white theater. So oh, absolutely. Again, it's hypocritical, isn't it, really? Hmm. And the Beatles, remember the Beatles said, we're not yeah. playing there unless, you know, uh, it's, um, you know, we have the blacks in as well. Yeah, because we weren't used to that in this country. We, well, we didn't have anything like that no. uh, in this country. So it was it was a, a very different scene socially um, in America. And of course, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, you know, I didn't go to the uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, for some reason, Harold Wilson decided it wasn't part of our brief um, to go there, um, and so you know, we, we didn't have that either, because you know, if you look at the influences on so pop music, if you like, of the fifties and sixties, uh, the Vietnam War, the civil rights struggle, and the communist thing, the McCarthy era, uh, yeah. you know, Reds under the uh, under the beds, uh, that was another big um, social issue. I mean, people like Pete Seeger uh, were found um, guilty of uh, contempt by, by Congress. Uh, because they wouldn't uh, divulge what their politics were. And so many were uh, blacklisted as being communist uh, sympathizers. Charlie, Charlie Chaplin was. Charlie yeah. Chaplin. Yeah. He, he went to yeah. live in Switzerland yeah. and the blacklisted. Yeah. So, you know, different times. And, you know, some of the songs that, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, they, they very much uh, reflect that. I mean, Frank Zappa, um, great guy. Uh, he wrote in 66 a track called uh, uh, Trouble Coming Every Day. It was on his first album, uh, Freak Out. Um, and that was about the um, uh, August 1965 riots in, in Watts. And to put uh, uh, Los Angeles, to put it into context, I was, I was you know, just looking at this for this show to talk about it. Uh, I came across this wonderful summary uh, at the beginning of this article. And it, it said, uh, you know, the result of the Watts riots were 34 deaths, 1,032 injuries, 4,000 arrests involved 34,000 people, the destruction of 1,000 buildings, and $40 million worth of uh, damage. And th that was over six days, uh, the 11th to the 16th of um, August. 1965. So, you know, this this is not just a, a bit of a scuffle down the back, as it were. Yeah. I mean, th th that is just unbelievable. That amount of damage, forty million dollars worth of damage, thirty four well, deaths. Then. Wow. Going back then, yeah, it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. But that's the way the states are. Yeah. Same as today. It's the same today. Exactly. It's the same. Well, this, this, is, this is what appears to be kind of quelled a little bit. In I know we're all, we're, none of us are 21 again, and the music scene has changed, uh, not for the greatest, I don't think we agree, but that freedom of expression and freedom of speech that um, artists had in the 60s and the 70s to a degree, was kind of started um, to be quelled in the 80s and the 90s and now, now we're here. So there are very few people who stand up like Bob Dylan um, and will say a song about, you know, um, this is the way the world is going and we've got to stop this. There are a few songs that get through, but they're not, they're not as uh, embraced 
I don't think as it was in the 60s and 70s. I think it was a powerful time um, for uh, artists of every description, writers, um, broadcasters, artists, musicians, to come out and express their opinion, which is now, uh, you're, you're almost vilified if you do that now. You know, you have um, oh, yeah. the likes yeah. of Kelly Lineker who might say something on Twitter and then oh, it, it blows up across the news and it's, it's not, people, people sometimes need a gentle nudge to say, this is not real, but if you read that or you listen to that, that's real. Um, and we don't have that now, certainly not in music. You know, yeah. and and God bless those that do stand up and say, you know. No, I, I understand that, but to me, I've got a thing up there up in, in the corner, where am I here? Over there in the corner, mm. uh, you know, free Assange because his freedom of speech is being taken away from him, mm. and it, it's just wrong the way it is. Look at yes. John Lennon, happy yes. ex war is over. You know, yeah. give peace a chance. All we are saying is give peace a chance. And yeah. all you need is love. You know, th yeah. these were, they, they, this was resonating during the Vietnam War. Yes. And it was getting out there. And, yeah. you know, Amer the American government didn't like it. And going back to what you said about uh, Harold Wilson, because, uh, um, gee, you know, the president at the time, Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, he said, I'd like your boys over in uh, Vietnam and join us. And he said, my boys are not going nowhere near hmm. Vietnam. That was Wilson. That was Wilson's yeah. So, you know, the, the likes of the songs uh, coming out at the time uh, were warning people. They were warning you know, what's it's, it's yeah, and what's interesting about that John Lennon example, the give peace a chance, uh, was what he did in, in the December of 69. Um, he actually started a poster campaign, and th that was the one where the poster said, War is over if you want it. Happy oh. Christmas from John and Yoko. And what he did, that was an international campaign. Uh, the posters appeared simultaneously in 12 cities. Uh, around the world. I mean, you know, you just couldn't imagine that um, happening now. Yeah. Interesting what? enough, though, when he, when he launched that and it became, um, mm. he, he tried to ridicule it, which is, which is what happens, you know, when you oppose uh, a governmental um, ultimatum. They try and ridicule the, the thing. But he... Interesting for me was that he chose Canada hmm. to launch the and to record the song and not in America. That's right. Possibly for fear of some form of rivals, yeah, consequences. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, wasn't it? You know. Recorded. It was recorded in hotels. Yeah, in room 1742. It's, um, I won't attempt the French pronunciation because we are talking Montreal. Uh, but basically, it's the Queen Elizabeth uh, Hotel. And oh, when, yeah. when you hear that uh, sort of drum sound on it, on the sort of offbeat, I think it is, um, I, I think that was somebody um, slamming the, uh, gently slamming the uh, bedroom door or a, a wardrobe door against sort of his leg or his foot or something. Uh, to get yeah. that uh, percussion uh, sound, but yeah. it's interesting as well. The, the the censorship that was going on. Another great example of that in 1967 uh, from Pete Seeger. He, he wasn't very impressed with the Vietnam War either, and no. he wrote um, uh, a recorded a song called uh, "Waist Deep in the Big Muddy." And uh, what he did, what it was basically, it was uh, an army captain leading his men. You know up the garden path, as it were, um, to certain death, as it were. Um, and, uh, you, you know, people go, well, you, do we really want to be going down that way? Do we really want to be going down that way? And in the song, the, the this captain says, um, refers to, don't be a nervous Nelly. 
And what that was, that was a reference to Lyndon Johnson, because that was a phrase he used famously uh, in a speech and several times to describe what were called peaceniks, you know, people who were very much against the war. And what happened, he, was, he recorded a, a version of that live. Well, no, he recorded it um, for the Smothers Brothers, uh, who did a lot of rock and roll stuff on there. Uh, and he recorded on that particular day. And when it was transmitted a week or two later, it had been edited out. It had been completely censored. Um, wow. What was good, though, I can't remember how long after it was, maybe six months or something. The Smothers Brothers, it wasn't them that uh, you know, censored it. Uh, they invited him back on the show about six months later. It might have been more, might have been a bit less. Um, and he uh, recorded it uh, again. But it's interesting to see how, you know, something like the Vietnam War, freedom of speech, you know, was completely censored on a TV show, edited out. And I think that's a typical uh, example of what was going on at the time. Wow, that, that's incredible. That, that's absolute. Can you just, uh, before you go, uh, can you ask it? I'll answer this from my this comment. A change is going to come by Sam Cooke. There's one as well, 1964. A change is going to come. Is, oh, that, is that for the, uh, you know, the, the fight against the injustices towards the black people, the civil rights, in other words? Yeah. I, I think that was one of the very last, if not the last hit records he had, because he was, well, uh, most people consider murdered um, shortly after that. Uh, some kerfuffle in a hotel. Uh, with some lady, chased some lady, I think she'd stolen his wallet, or wh whatever the story was, v various stories. And the hotel uh, manager S lady shot him dead, you know, talk about a senseless uh, waste. I mean, Sam Cooke, I mean, what an awesome character, because he came out of the, the whole gospel world. He was very much a gospel what a voice. Yeah. singer. Yeah. What a Fabulous voice. voice. It's well, funny how you, you, you talk about there, Derek, um, you know, about the gospel belt. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've mentioned this before as well. The likes of Elvis came out of that, didn't he? Oh, very much, yeah. I mean, he, he was very nearly a gospel singer. Shortly after he joined um, uh, Sun Records, and before he'd actually released um, his, his first single on Sun, uh, there was a famous... Uh, gospel group uh, in the Memphis area and they had um, a sort of offshoot group and Elvis uh, tried to join it he went in I can't remember the names now uh, the, he, he went and audition for them and he failed the audition because they didn't think uh, he could harmonize they thought he was a good lead singer but they did they, I think they think he, he was more of a less of a team player than you'd want oh. on a in a gospel group, and he, he didn't get in. And then what happened, tragically, um, there was a plane crash, and a couple of guys in the gospel group, the main gospel group, were killed. And they went back to Elvis and said, to, you know, would you like to come and join us? But then uh, it's, 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 you know, first son single. That's all right. Uh, all right, mama. Um, you, you know, it had started certainly locally. It was very, very big. So his rock and roll career had started. So if that all happened a year before, the chances are Elvis would have been a, you know, a, a, a footnote in uh, in history, yeah, and you know, a, a more of a, a Johnny Cash. Not that Johnny Cash is a footnote, but you know, yeah. he'd be more known for the sort of country sto stroke um, gospel because Elvis he, he recorded, he recorded cool. five uh, singles, so ten sides at Sun Records. Four of them were national hits on the country uh, Billboard Top Forty. It wasn't until he went to RCA and Heartbreak Hotel that he actually cracked the, the main, you know, pop top 40. But he had four hits. I, one of them was number one. So, you know, th there is a parallel universe where Elvis is very much a gospel country singer and probably would have been about as famous as Johnny Cash, uh, you know, because he'd have had crossover hits when yeah, uh, yeah. Like Johnny Cash did. So it, it's right. interesting how life goes. And that's all right, Ma that's all right Mama. Is that yeah. was his... Fish, that was fish. the first one, yeah. Well, no, that wasn't a hit. <laughs> it wasn't one of those. Um, I forget which four they were. I'm right, you're left, she's gone uh, was one of them. Um, I can't remember what the others were offhand. But four of the ten were country hits. One of them was a number one. Incredible. What was that? Uh, well, I, I love that line you mentioned at the beginning uh, of the show, that is. 
I like it was it I like your bike. It's got a bell on. Or do you want to ride my bike? It's got <laughs> oh, a bike. I got a bike. You can ride it if you like. It's got a bell on. So uh, I know that you know I couldn't carry a tune to save my life. It sounds That's all right to me. Brilliant. <laughs> I, I love that. You know, could you imagine someone sitting there waiting that? They must have been... Oh, that was Sid know. Barrett. I mean, Sid Barrett. Mercurial, Wonder to say the least. <coughs> Absolutely. See, he wrote 10 of the uh, songs on that. There were a couple. I think one was a uh, a water song and one was a sort of group group effort. But he wrote most of that. And he, and he designed the uh, the back sleeve. And he was only ever on the well. He was on a, a little bit of the second album, but you know, Dave Gilmore came on the scene by the second album. So, do you reckon, to, uh, uh, Derek? You know, before you go, uh, that the sixties, you know, well, the late fifties was the springboards with the likes of Elvis. And that's all, uh, Mama. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm only, you know, <laughs> it was the springboard for rock and roll, and then uh, the sixties was the springboard for everything oh it was the 60s that matured the music there's no two ways about that yeah. there was a comment earlier about the 70s and fragmentation uh, you know the fragmentation uh, that went on then that really all started in the mid 60s and just carried on uh, up until punk you had kraut rock um, you had uh, glam rock um, you know all various kinds of um, metal and I mean, metal itself is one of the few genres that's still really going in the same way. Well, I say the same way. There are about 10,000 million uh, sort of strands, as far as I can see, to um, uh, heavy metal. Do you know what? Instead of next time, if you if you don't mind, Eddie, there's been some cracking comments there, you know, coming on, you know, what about this in the 60s and the 70s and whatever, and, and the likes of Soul Boy coming out with a couple of things, but Marvin Gaye and Sam Cooke and things yeah. like that. Do you fancy just answering, you know, like the way we yeah. just came on and just meant, you know, like comments is on the comments, if yeah. you know what I mean. About yeah, your knowledge right. and everything else, you, you, you just mind you in that rather than saying, it, Oh, can you talk about the small faces? Or, you know, you, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, you don't absolutely. mind. No, I don't I mean, mind at all. That'd be great. Oh, that's interesting. Derek, it's been absolutely great. <laughs> even, even Anthony liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm just happy to be here. I've, you know, I love it. Oh, it's just been fascinating. It really is. And the people have absolutely been brilliant, you know, asking me uh, and commenting on the yeah. on everything there. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the, the the 60s was my type of uh, mm. genre, to be, to be honest. And Gary Rigby says, tomorrow, my white bicycle is another great bike song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after the Amsterdam bicycles, free bicycles. Yeah, it's tomorrow, know. isn't it? My white bicycle. It's a fabulous track. Look, oh, really, really, like, really good example of psychedelia. I love it. It's like uh, you know the Beatles, say, "Baby, won't you drive my car?" You know, it, yeah. it, it's just unbelievable the way yeah. they like they can bring in vehicle. Yeah. I've got a ticket to ride. We're ah, have a transport session one week. It. <laughs> it's incredible, you know, the way, like, they try to fit things in. I'm talking about songwriters, that is, and, you know, they just play and make a tune up and do everything. Because we don't realise, this is why Anthony and myself like classical music. You, you do it yourself, obviously, Derek. Uh, you know, these, like, these composers. Mm. Unbelievable. Yeah. Do you know what I want you to listen to, if you don't mind? Okay. It's not long, actually. I don't mean now. Like, I, 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 it's not a pop song, actually. Mm. But it's just like how these people put things together. And mm. it's Carl Orff's um, O Fortuna. O Fortuna, you know. The look oh, of the torture. Yeah. O oh, four yeah. tuner, it's just yeah. you know, just the O, not no H with it. O oh, four yeah. tuner from okay. uh, I mean, a Barana, you know. Oh, the, I love that. Well, there you go. Please, and when you come back in a couple of weeks, will you let let me know 
uh, what you think of it, please. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing, just a parting th sort of uh, comment there on the classical music. Of course, when you get to people like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, I mean, one of the first things they recorded, or certainly played, was uh, Pictures of an Exhibition, Mazorgsky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but when you get to the Emerson, Lake and Palmers of the world, the Rick Wakeman's of the world, I mean, classically trained, but actually playing classical music in a rock way. Deep Purple mm -hmm. recorded uh, with an orchestra. One of their albums is called something like Deep Purple and Orchestra. So, oh, you know, it's it really spreading that way. But, yeah, that'd be great. Derek, thank you. Um, you know, in a couple of weeks, will you, you know, all for tune it, right? By yep. Carl Orff, right? Right, and uh, I've just got to answer this, Jeff Lamb. Hi, Frank, did you tell the Richie Blake story yet? No, it's in the next hour. We have a little break now, you know, uh, show a clip or something, and then we're back and I'll be telling you about uh, Richie Blake and Soul Boy Frank. Rossini, the Italian girl and Algiers classic. Rossini, yeah. Anyway, I've got to have this break now. To, uh, the other fella will be going to me, you know, invisible hand coming here. Derek, a couple of weeks, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, really good. Cheers, Anthony. Cheers, Frank. Have a good Cheers, one. Derek. Thank you. This is St. John's Gardens, but why isn't it called St. George's Gardens? After all, this is St. George's Hall. The answer is simple. What stood here since 1771 was St. John's Church. And don't forget, St. George's Hall wasn't built until 1854. Take a look at this. This is an actual picture of St. John's Church being demolished in 1898. Sadly, there are not many pictures left of it. There's a great urban myth surrounding the hall and the myth is that the hall was built back to front but how can the hall be built back to front when St John's Church is already established in place and also what do you associate with the church? A cemetery, it's as simple as that. So why would the architect Harvey Lonsdale Elms have a steps plateau coming into a cemetery? The hall was not built back to front because Lime Street Station that was there in 1836 and only the rich people could afford to get on the trains came out of Lime Street Station and seen this wonderful building with its steps and plateau. The myth unfortunately continues with the death of its architect Harvey Lonsdale Elms. He was supposed to have committed suicide when he returned 12 years later and seen the hall built back to front. It's a load of nonsense and it's been fabricated over the years. Unfortunately he did die seven years before the completion of the hall in Jamaica where he was sent by his physicians to recover from a common disease tuberculosis there are other myths within this vicinity so let's go over and have a look at Nelson Nelson we're on the steps of the Whale Museum William Brown Street and did I say a moment or two ago that this was Nelson in fact it's an easy mistake to make actually it's the Duke of Wellington 
And people often ask, why he doesn't overlook the city? Well, he's actually facing Waterloo as the crow flies his most famous victory in 1815. You'll like this. He's not made from bronze or marble or stone. He's made from the French cannons captured at Waterloo. Now, now it's not there neither. It's very hard to find these things. It's not here. That's it. Ah, yeah, there it is here. Because when you go in there, down there, there's a spiral staircase that leads right to the top. You open up the doors and you clean the monument itself and the Duke. Where shall we go next? From a huge monument to a much smaller one in Rodney Street. And there's some story behind that one. This is Rodney Street, the home of William Mackenzie. Did he live in one of these fantastic Georgian buildings? No. The myth is, he's in a pyramid. This is John Foster's St Andrew's Church, which, unfortunately, has seen better days. The myth surrounds William Mackenzie, a Scottish railway contractor who was another gambler. His ambition was to have a royal flush, the highest hand you can have in poker. Mackenzie said if he never fulfilled his ambition in life, he surely wanted to fulfill it in death. His will stipulated his instructions very, very well, right down to the finest detail that he should be sitting at a chair with a bottle of scotch holding a royal flush in his hand. So if he never fulfills it in life, he surely would fulfill it in death. So is it just a myth that Mackenzie is in the pyramid or is it fact? I'd like to think that he is sitting in the pyramid with his glass of scotch holding his royal flush. I really like to think so. That was Frank with dark hair. Eh? <laughs> I've tried it since. I've tried it uh, grey. <laughs> but I think time's tried it for me. I think, uh, I think it has. But anyway, uh, I've got a couple of uh, little stories to tell and whatever. And one of them is a, a real hero of Liverpool and no one seems to know about him. Nobody. Nobody. You're going to like this, Anthony, about this particular person. Because on the 11th of May, which is my birthday, strangely enough, uh, there's a commemoration to, uh, you know, the sailors that have died and whatever, it's down at uh, St Mary's and St Nicholas Church at the period, known as St Nick's. St Nick's. The, um, Anthony, why aren't you on? I'm sorry there, Anthony. That's all so right, Frank. I'm, um, I'm pining over that guy with the cards and the glass of whiskey. <laughs> I wonder if there's a back door into that too. I'll just check <laughs> I've actually seen, do you know what, I've actually seen a footage of that. Some Americans came in and put in, you know, one of those little telescopic things. Oh, that yeah. You yeah. operations, you know, to go and see, you know, around yeah. your body and things. And uh, what they found, they, got, they, they, they brought in a, oh, what you call them, an ostrich. An osteopath? No, I don't know. You know those people who uh, look at your bones and that, you know, anyway. He brought that in. Brought the hair in, hair in, by the way. And uh, they brought a fella in who, uh, who, who's a, a specialist on uh, playing cards 
and they looked at some of the playing cards that were on the floor and uh, sh he said yeah this was around the time you know mid 19th century that these cards were made uh, so that was authentic and oh, the person who looks after the bones I forget, I forget even what they're called and um, she said uh, yes uh, what would happen you know if they're all in cards like that sitting at a table uh, the cards are fall because the bones just like go if you know what I mean. and then uh, when you look at there's a foot you see a foot like a shoe or foot and the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the trouser leg is right over it it's right over it you know as though something's like wow. gone away from it's hard to explain but anyway it was through time and everything else on their decay that the trouser leg just fell more or less on the shoe just nearly covering all the shoe and onto the floor so uh yeah yeah um, fascinating yeah, but anyway this uh this story i think you'd like and it's about uh yeah you read about the thesis didn't you the thesis yeah. uh that sunk in the the mercy at the tr in the trials and uh, like over a hundred people died and they died of suffocation so when they brought it back you know they, they finally the surface there because it was sticking in it was sticking in like this and there's lots of pictures about it anyway they brought it back and um the uh they did everything about it you know the the managed to make it all right you know they, they got rid of those mistakes and everything that just went that went like that during the trials and anyway they renamed it and they renamed it the sickle and the sickle you know went out you know to fight the germalines uh, all over the place and they ended up the sickle in the aegean sea in the aegean and uh, that's where the germans you know they, they, they occupied greece so anyway this particular sickle the submarine was in the ag and what had happened was this uh, gunboat german gunboat called them seen them and they were going after them and anyway the two lads the two lads uh were on you know do you know on the on the deck of the, the uh, on the deck of the sickle with the machine gun you know them big heavy machine guns and they were firing at these germans and the the siren went for them to go below so anyway they ran as it was going down and uh, the unfortunate thing is this lad was only small and he was only a kid and his name was richard blake and richard blake was it Oh. and he went into the sea now don't forget this is the Aegean and the Aegean has got sharks there right now he's got blood coming out of him obviously he's got blood so he's got them bang anyway uh, he's in the sea the uh this the the the, uh, the submarine it goes under you know it goes under and it gets away leaving him floundering in the AG and the gumbo came along spotted him and got him out just as well because you know even to die could have been eaten by sharks or anything and he was wounded and he was bleeding heavily so anyway they brought him on board got him back uh, to the lands on land and a doctor said him a surgeon and they operated on him this surgeon operated on him, the German surgeon. And anyway, they took, uh, you know, these like things out of him yeah. that wounded him, you know. And yeah. he gave him them. He gave him them. I think they were, he wrapped them up in a handkerchief. And he said, Yeah, hey, uh, that's a, a souvenir for you. Right, said Richard Blake. 
Now, don't forget, Richard Blake now is a prisoner of war, and he brought him up to uh, Berlin or somewhere else. I don't know. I'm not quite sure now whether they were bringing him to Berlin or, you know, to the Gestapo to uh, interrogate him. And he, when he got on the, the, uh, the train, there was German people sitting on the train and they were looking at uh, little Richard Blake and they were calling him murder because he was the enemy to the Germans and they were, you know, shouting at him and you know, whatever. And anyway, uh, they get him up, they, they get him there and they start interrogating him. And obviously, you know, where he was ruined is, you know, they were pulling that, punching it. And he was saying, uh, what's the name of the ship? And, you know, what's the name of the submarine? And he said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm not saying. What's the name of the uh, submarine? No, I'm not. So they interrogated them. And don't forget this lad, this kid. He's only young. Little fella. Little able seaman in a submarine. And uh, he wouldn't say nothing. He wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't say nothing. He only gave his rank, you know, his name and his rank and his number. And uh, he wouldn't say anything. Anyway, the uh, news got to him. And he said, was you on a submarine called the Sickle? And he went, no. <laughs> you can imagine him saying, no. Because you know what happened to the, sing- the Sickle? When it uh, when sons and Ethan got away, it was actually spotted a few days later, and he got it, and he was dead charged it, and oh. everybody was killed aboard the sickle, everyone, and he was the only survivor of that, and yet he was a prisoner of war. How brave is he? No one hears about this little fella named Richard Blake. Richard Blake is one of my little heroes. Yeah. You know, we talk about these wonderful people, which they are, the wonderful people, you know, of yeah. Liverpool. And you've heard me talking about these great people, these great philanthropists yeah. and war heroes, great poets. You mentioned the war poets before. Uh, Wilfred Owen, you know, unbelievable. But when you, you, you know, the likes of this lad, he went through a war, you know, as a prisoner, you know, as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, how lucky, how lucky was he? How lucky was Richard Blake to be <laughs> it? Go in the water, you know, it's just floating there trying to keep off he's wounded heavily bleeding, I... bleeding you know and these sharks around and whatever that is and, very important um, isn't it but the great irony yeah. had he got back on the sub then he would have been killed a few days later oh yeah 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 he would have been gone he would have, you know this lad wouldn't have had a family wouldn't have had a family and a, a lady got in touch with me, Patricia, and she says, hey, Frank, I remember you talking about uh, my uncle. Now, oh, she would yeah. never have got older of me if Richard would have been perished or would have perished. No. I wouldn't have known about Richard Blake, no. the little man who survived as a, you know, he's a kid, for God's sake, in the, the AG and C. After being hit by uh, you know this gunboat, but picked up luckily, luckily enough, and they're uh, taken, and then you know even the German surgeon who operated on him must have felt sorry for him. Let's be honest, saved his life, and uh, wrapped his uh, the shrapnel and whatever and gave them. And he said, "Here, yeah, that will be a souvenir for you." Isn't that a fantastic story? Uh, and he did to tell the tale. If to tell the tale to me. Fantastic. Yeah. 
you know, so it, it, it's things like that. Can I just uh, just go through some stuff here? Uh, Lynn Ellis says, brilliant as usual, says Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, excellent stuff, Frank, says DW. Uh, DW again. It's a macabre thought that he's just sitting there crumbling away. That's about uh, the other fella. Yeah, yeah. to put him in two. Yeah. And uh, then Ellis, brilliant. Oh, thank you, Lynn. And uh, Gary Lamb, cheers, Frank. Brilliant. Richie Blake was my uncle. <laughs> there you go. Wonderful. Wonderful, isn't that lovely? That's lovely. Do you yeah. know what? My dad, uh, incidentally, was a uh, he was an officer in the Royal New Zealand uh, Navy, and he was here, and he was in the uh, he was a S S S B S Special Boat Service, you know, like the S A S. Yeah, yeah. He used to go in as a frogman himself and blow up a uh, submarine. <laughs> Wow, wow! I think we actually yeah. managed to did you did you, did you destroy our uh, Royal Irish? You know because she seen pictures. Oh. She said, no, that was the First World War. <laughs> oh, that was the never. unbelievable! Yeah. Unbelievable! My, my great granddad, uh, Thomas Brennan Senior, was a survivor of Lusitania, and. Uh, that that's a, a an ongoing family history really we're trying to find out yeah. more and more as we go along but it's and, uh, and, and, and it's a shame it's like jeff lamb here i think he's must be gary's brother uh, it's great to hear the story publicized listening now are his nephews graham gary john and myself thanks frank thank you that's brilliant Absolutely. And yeah. you know, anything like that, uh, and there's a, there's the opening lines of Anthem for Doom Duke from uh, Wilfred Owen yeah. is, uh, what passing bells for these who die as cattle? And that's what it's like in any war. You know, yeah. that young lad. Now, he had his mates on board. Yeah. He had his mates on board, on, on board the sub, you know, all mates and enjoying, but worrying about, you know, oh, I can't wait till I get home and, you know, on leave or whatever. And I'll tell you what, we'll go, we'll go to such a place, yeah, we'll do this and that. Yeah. Never to fulfil, because Richie Blake, Richard Blake, would never see his comrades again. Yeah. You know, as sailor mates, he'd never see them again. It's like my uh, ex partner, there, dad. Uh, he was a desert rat and he was in, they, they were hiding away from the Germans. They were getting shelled and he was meeting in it. You know, there's only the two of them. And this fella, he, he known as Blackie. He known as Blackie. And he said, uh, Tell you what, Blackie. We're doomed here. I think we've got to get out of this place. He said, you wouldn't cocoa. He said, we have to. Now, Blackie <laughs> came from Sussex. <coughs> he was a, a Liverpool lad. And he said, what shall we do? And Harry said, I'll tell you what, let's go this way. And he went, no. He said, it'll be better this way. And he went, no. no. He said, Blackie, trust me, let's get this way. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll go this way. You go that way, Harry. And we'll meet up oh. and we'll have a laugh. So he said, okay. You know, he did he was reluctant to say okay. Because he was so sure that it was more danger that way where Blackie wanted to go. So anyway, Blackie was killed. Blackie was killed. And after the war, Harry went down to Sussex to uh, Harry's, uh, Black Blackie's parents. And he just said, I'm so sorry. And they, they knew of him because he'd been like, they, you know, he'd been like normal about uh, his mate, yeah. his comrades, you know, in the army. 
and what they used to get up to and whatever and that's a lot because he was a scouser yeah and yeah. Uh, every 11th of november he never ever went to senator he always had he always had a photograph of him and blackie against you know on the sideboard standing up and there's medals there and he, he always wore his hat you know his beret or whatever and he just saluted them. you know what i mean yeah every yeah. 11th of november for two minutes two minutes silence and yeah. it's it's things like that it's things like richard blee yeah. that we yeah. we don't know we just don't know about and yeah. it's nice just to get to know this little Blake. not get to know him but to know of him to yeah. know yeah. about him to know what what he went through imagine being it and going in the water yeah going in the water and just trying to keep afloat and it's then the germans came along and incredible story such a positive story and, mm -hmm. and the reward from it is is that the family uh, are still there and rightly proud of of such mm -hmm. a gentleman well let's go through some uh, things you know uh gary rigby i love uh liverpool mysteries i remember the elves and jubilee drag kenzie yeah the, about the elves yeah yeah and my mate uh, we go on alternative uh, sites we don't follow the uh, the narrative you see dw frank got me looking to see if there are sharks in the aegean because i was certain the meds is shark free how wrong i was the straits between sicily and italy is considered to be a major breeding ground Oh, I was in, um, I was, where was I? I was in Sardinia. And I can't swim, really. I can't swim. I, I, I'm being honest, you know. I'm the proverbial fella who sits on the beach. Me and too. Us fellas, yeah, us fellas are on past, you know, all the sand gets kicked in your face, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm that. I mean, me and you. And what has happened? Um, I was, I, I went into the water and I was paddling. You know, because it was shallow, it was just paddling. And anyway, this fella came up to me and he says, All right, you know, it's hello. And he said, Do you know what? And he was just saying, about, like, by that way. He said, Do you know that a great white came up here, like in Jaws, and was just swimming around about there? And he was only pointing about six feet away. I said, Oh, and he went straight. So Frank mm -hmm. was like the Jaws film, you know, where they're all running out. Yeah. <laughs> wow, my no God. way. And uh, yes, so it, it is a breeding ground, ZW. And there you go. Now, I didn't see that. For great white sharks. Yeah. There you go. The great whites. And uh, John Lamb. Great story, Frank. You're right. You're right. Our Richie was a little fella, but so brave to have gone through that. Cheers for sharing. No, it's a pleasure. But I've said it. I've said it a few times, John. I've said about him. I've said it, said it in lectures when I've been speaking about the wars and you know what's gone on in wars and whatever. And uh, you know the likes of. Uh, Richard Blake, I, I interviewed and met him. I met him, and he was such a lovely man, such a lovely man. And uh, you know, he, he was old then, he was old then, unfortunately. But he told me, you know, the story, and he was laughing about it as well. He was serious, but laughing as well. I think he was laughing because you know, he got old. But he's so sad that he missed, you know, he, he never got to see his comrades after. And Jeff Lamb says, uh, 
just to add this, my mum, Pat Blake, told me after he was home from the prisoner of war, he tried to join the Navy again. <laughs> what a man. Mm. Oh, that, what a man. Look, you know, there's a lad, there's a lad, believe it or not, Jeff, there's a lad by the name of William Rackley. And, uh, well, two sure, lads, William Rackley. And he was uh, a veteran of the Boer War, and he was too old to finish, uh, to you know, enlist into the Wales War One. And he said, and he said, well, I've got to do the uh, thing anyway. What he did, he became a stretcher bearer, stretcher bearer, and he used to bring, you know, as many as the wounds are back as possible, or the wounds are back as possible, and many of the dead back as well from no man's land and he's seen this machine gun post and it was firing down firing down at lads over 200 of them being pinned down and being shot by this machine gun and he put down he actually put down a stretcher because he was tending this lad this young boy must have been about 17. And he had his hair over his head. He was dead. His hair was just falling over his forehead. And he pushed it back. And he mm. went like that on his cheek. And he said, your death won't become in vain, son. And took his rifle off him. Because they had no, uh, they had no weapons. So he took his rifle off and went up towards the machine gun post and took them out took them out and then he picked up the German big machine gun you can imagine he picked that up and we got always looking for more and firing or whatever and he just he just threw down the machine gun picked the lad's rifle up and shouted over to the lads go on go ahead lads go on get back to your lines and they just my lad, thanks mate and he just walked down to that lad walked down to that lad put his rifle next to him crossed his arm the rifle was here so he crossed his arm and brought him back brought him back he he was awarded the victoria cross for that and i've got a i've got a victoria cross here he was awarded the victoria cross one of them he was awarded. Isn't that unbelievable? Look at that. The Victoria Cross. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you can say a lot of things about a lot of people. There was another fella by the name of George Gabriel Curie. And George Gabriel Curie worked down in Old Hall Street. And he worked, uh, you know, the Albany, you know, the big Albany building, yeah. which yeah. is apartments now. And uh, he was working there for his family. And he was in the cotton business. And anyway, the war broke out and he wanted to join. And uh, he, he became an officer in the Pioneer Corps. Now, the Pioneer Corps, like Richard Blake, they never, ever get mentioned ever the pioneer corps yeah it was one of the most dangerous jobs ever you know people think like you, you know the ordinary soldier and war of attrition yeah very dangerous don't get me wrong but the pioneer corps was unbelievable because what they had to do they had to put up barbed wire fencing they had to go beyond the lines to dig other trenches so that our lads, you know, could get up there and get into those trenches. They had to do everything. They had to clear roads, you know, with, with, with debris and whatever. They had to do that. And they used to have to bring up the ammunition. And they were digging this trench, this massive trench. Massive trench for our lads to advance so they were there digging away, being under fire constantly all the time by the Germans. So anyway, as they were digging the fence, they had to bring up there 
the ammunition for the soldiers because you can't just go like that and, like, and shoot six rounds. You've got no gun. You've got no, you know, it becomes useless then. So they have to bring the uh, munitions up. And anyway, Curie, he was the captain, George Gabriel Curie. And what had happened was he went to the Collegiate on Shore Street. He went to the Collegiate on Shore Street, the same one that um, Leonard Rossiter went to. Leonard Rossiter. Brian Labone, he played forever. He was there as well, you know, at the Collegiate. Yeah. So this lad, uh, you know, from the Collegiate, he, he, a shell, a German shell at the munitions, and it just blew up. Oh. And I, everyone was running, scrambling, and he was running down the parapet, going, get back in, you know, like, get back in. You'll be killed. Get back in, running up and down the parapet. Get get back in. And uh, what he, when he turns around, what he see was an advancement of the Germans, you know, coming up. Oh. He has a pistol. You know, one of those... Yeah. You know, Ulster pistols, that's all he had. And he started going towards them firing. And uh, he got them back, he stopped the advance. Him alone stopped the advance. <laughs> when he got back, you know, the Victoria Cross. George Gabriel Curie. And after the war, after the war, unfortunately, what has happened, uh, his business went, the Americans took over the cotton, the cotton industry. Uh, so the business failed. And he opens up, he opens up a chippy in Brunswick Road around the corner from the collegiate. And he used to have is um, he used to have his uh, medal hanging up there. Kids used to go in, you know, like the media kid. Oh, what's that, Mister? You know, that's a medal. What kind of a medal is that? You know, so and he used to tell them, but he was a very modest man. And when the Second World broke, broke, World broke out, he joined. He joined, and he actually was there on D Day. He landed on D Day. Wow. This Victoria Cross one, and he could have easily have been killed. George Gabriel Cooney, and uh, it's like um, it's like William Ratcliffe. Now William Ratcliffe never ever married, and he li he lived with his sister and her husband, and unfortunately both of them died. So he was on his own, and uh, he died. He died. Because people never seen him walking around because people used to say to him, hello, Mr. Ratcliffe. And he used to say, hello, boys. Yeah. Very modest man. Yeah. And he was always upright because they were playing football, you know, in St. Oswald Gardens where he lived in Old Swan there. And um, they had to break the door down, you know, the police. And they found him dead. He oh. just died on his own. A Victoria Cross over, you know. So the likes of uh, these lads, the Victoria Cross holders, the part of me, the likes of William, uh, you know, uh, Richard Blake is a part of me, because these lads deserve to be told about. Did these you? Lads. It's possible, on it, and I, I, I know. Um, for when you you talked about William Radcliffe in, in the past, the the idea of of a, a memorial and blue plaque has kind of been shelved up the way. There should be a body of the the services that that could do that. Um, but yeah, absolutely should be talked about. Should be written about. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, here's the cross dresser, Norman. Norm. 
All right, Frank and Anthony, I know that this is not a film review, but I watched The Under, Under Suspicion with Morgan Freeman and Gene Ackman. I don't get the ending. Who the hell did it? I'll tell you later. I'll tell you on the uh, the film on uh, TV. I've not seen that. Oh, it's brilliant. But you, you can get it on YouTube. And Graham Lamb, he says, uh, so the Richie Blake's so the Richie Blake story goes that his parents thought he had died on the sickle only to find out after the war when he knocks on the door that he was alive. Uh, Isn't that brilliant? That's amazing. Isn't that just it, it just puts the cherry on the cake, doesn't it? Oh gosh, yeah. It just puts the cherry because that happened to uh, a lad from Birkenhead named uh, John Davis. When he, he, you know, we went over a, a canal, and all his mates were getting shot at by the Germans on the other side of the canal, on the parapet there, and he says, "Ah, I'm getting, I'm, I'm going to take these on." And they thought, "Oh, they are not, don't do that, stay with us." He said, "Is he getting killed? We're getting killed." So he he got up, jumped on the parapet, started fighting the Germans, and a big uh, shell went up, and there was all smoke and everything else, and. Zembri, mm -hmm. and uh, he went, you know, he saved our lives. And he was awarded the Victoria Cross posthumously. And uh, at the end of the, uh, the war, his parents were so proud. And yet, again, it's the juxtaposition between uh, happiness and sadness. Yeah. Where you have the happiness that their son, you know, our son, he received a Victoria Cross, and the sadness is that we'll never see him again yeah. Yeah. because he was killed. Yeah. yeah. Yet, at the end of the war, <laughs> we'll knock at the door. When the door opened, yeah. there was John, John Davis, the son, and his mother. <laughs> You can't because, you know, if you think about it, he's the only man to be awarded the yeah. Victoria Cross posthumously, yet lived to see it because he was taken prisoner, whereas people, you know, his mates, his comrades thought that yeah. he was killed. Yeah. When he went on the parapet and all that smoke and everything else, but he wasn't, he was taken prisoner and he lived out the rest of the war. And he was awarded the Victoria Cross for saving those lads. You see, I just love it. And the Redbird says, um, I'll have to watch the replay, Frank. Just popped in to uh, to like uh, people. Please, people, hit the like button. This is an emergency. <laughs> Frank needs them for his algae rhythms. <laughs> Don't you just love that, man? Don't you just love that, man? So, you know, history is a, 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 is a, is a, a number. They yeah, are, look, now, here's Pak Hong Chan. There was about 100,000 Chinese recruited by the British in Wales War want yet yeah, to take trenches repair roads vehicles etc the chinese labor corps and do you know what again it's like the uh, the pioneer corps yeah and that's what they did and what never ever gets mentioned uh, uh, i remember um down here at the elzonian estate this lad i forget his name um he, he's in the uh I'm not saying the scrap business sounds like a bit, you know, but he's in this business and uh, and he got hold of uh, Tony McGann at the time and he said, Tony, I've got a statue here. And that statue, turned, you know, they just threw it in the dump. People just threw it, in, you know, bronze statue. They threw it in a dump. I know. Uh, anyway. Uh, the crew was in the dump, and he said, I've taken it out. 
He said, I'd like you to come down and look at it. So anyway, Tony McGann went down, looked at the statue, and it was of Christ the King. It was of Christ the King. And there was only five ever made around the 1780s in Paris. Wow. Five, five of these statues. There's only three left. The other two had just disappeared, you know, through wars and whatever. The others. One, one is in the Vatican. Wow. One is in, uh, I think it's the Sacre Coeur in Paris. Yeah, one yeah. is there. And the other one was this one. That, that's here now because this fella said uh, I'll do a duck for you I'll, I'll redo it I'll fix it up oh. at the sake of the dart and anyway he put it on the Eldonian estate and Tony got hold of me said would you give a talk about this he said yes yeah, sure and it was one um, it was you know it, it was a great day and I went down Gave the talk to loads of people. They were all the bishops there. Bishop Tom, who you know well, he yeah. was there. He oh. was there, and these other people. And But here's my point. There was a Chinese man. And I've got his card somewhere here. And he said, Frank, he said, I was at a, I, I was at a, a, a talk you were given. And it's only what Pak Hong Chan said. He said, I was at a talk you give, was given. And all of a sudden, and right out the blue, because what you were talking about was the May Blitz and how Liverpool survived. But what you mentioned, he said, was all rendering to me. He said, because I knew about it. And it never, ever gets mentioned until you mention it. And I said, what's that? I said, what are you talking about? And I was looking at him. And I went, I, and you know the way you're thinking? I wonder if he's going to mention, because I have mentioned it in the past. And that was 40-odd lads, Chinese lads, in this lodging house on the dock. And they're Chinese sailors, and they were killed by a bomb. You know, in the May Blitz, during the May Blitz, and yeah. no, but nobody ever, ever mentions that. Oh. Those Chinese lads. Oh. And, and he, 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 was, he said, "Will you come and give a talk for us?" I said, "Yeah, of course I will." Yeah. He said, "Okay, I'll be in touch." Um, the unfortunate thing is, he said, I, I, haven't, I said, I haven't got a card on me. I said, but you can easily get in touch. And funny enough, only last year it was, I was clearing out some things. And there's, there was that lad's card. Oh. That lad's card. Got it somewhere, really. So, fellow, a Chinese lad. Oh. So, yeah, you're right there. there. Oh, wonderful. I, sure. I, I, I had a dear friend. A musician called Norman Young, who Chinese, um, and I met through through a guitar club and stuff. And uh, he was considerably older than me, Norman. Um, he would talk about the Chinese during the First and Second World War, and how the northern part of the country, as you know very well, were first over a hill, whatever hill. And whatever battle, um, so uh, I, I that always kind of stayed with me, yeah. And and reading that there from from Chan. Well, as he says, there twenty thousand Chinese seamen were in Liverpool during World War Two. This is what I was talking about: serving in the Merchant Navy during the Battle of the Atlantic. Some married local women, but were kicked out after the war. Yes, you're right. You're right. 
it's like anything else, unfortunately. You know, lots of people, they don't realise the history of Liverpool. Albeit that it's, fun, don't get me wrong, it is fantastic history. And I love uh, the history. Of, we're second to none, by the way. But the point is, you know, there are some uh, things like what Pat Gunchan said, you know, that these lads served in the war. There was African lads as well who served in the war, and they were kicked out too. That's from the Caribbean. They were kicked out too. So, you know, you, you, you get everything. Even my own dad, after the war, he went, uh, yeah, well, all right, uh, you know. And, he, and his mates, they got him to uh, be, uh, you know, a merchant seaman because when he was demobbed uh, from the Navy, and he was an officer in the Navy. And anyway, he joined the, uh, the merchant seaman here in Liverpool. So he was here a few years, and he met up uh, with me, man. Mm. And married him. So instead of me being a Valencia, I'm a car like that. You're both some more. And it's strange, isn't it? You know, the way uh, Pac says there, you know, and kicked out after the war. Yeah. Yeah. It's just nuts. Yeah. It, it really is. But that's it. They were the hardships, to be honest, Pac. They were the hardships of... It's the way it goes. Uh, you know, we didn't hear it. It's like what the uh, the British government did, unfortunately, because they were just like, look, everybody gets used in wars, unfortunately. Everybody. Yeah. And Lynn Ellis, away for the night. Good night, Frank and Anthony and everyone. Good night, Lynn. Good night, Thank Lynn. You. Thank you. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. So, you know, you, you, people often ask me, they always ask me this, because as you know, I'm a specialist on building. What's your favourite building? You know, to me. And uh, I say, well, I can't tell you. It's hard for me to say about a certain building. Because if you pick St. George's Hall, for example, you've got to pick the other neoclassical stuff. Yeah. You've even got to pick, believe it or not, the frontage of Lamb Street Station. You've got to pick that. You, you, you have to. Well, so, you, you know, the, the hotel. You know. Yeah. Well, you, so, you, you, you've got an affinity... With the buildings and with the you've got you've got the knowledge to appreciate the aspects of all the different buildings. And where, whereas a lot of people might have saved their time in a building, um, Port of Liverpool was a, a great hive of industry and and, and stuff like that. Cunard building. Um, for me, I I I I'm you know people like me. We've got the kind of easy ride in that we're looking after the event and we're looking in, in fairly ignorant terms we see the building we we love the place but we're not as knowledgeable uh, on the architecture and who but a friend of mine who's a uh, uh, I, uh, a property developer right he said um, buildings are majestic and buildings are part of our life, but a building is nothing without the people in it. And I kind of understand that as well, um, the scale and the, the majestic um, angle of a building is summed up by the people in it. Yes. But, it's a simple, it's like a home, it's like yes. a house. Yes. You know, a, a house could be lovely on the outside, but inside, you never know what's going on, and it could be ugly. Yeah. So it, it's a false facade. Whereas if it's a beautiful facade and the people inside are beautiful, you've got a beautiful house. Yes. Like a building. 
Yeah. You know, I, 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 I always look. Sorry. Like a pride. If yeah. you work in one of those majestic buildings, you have a pride because it is, you know, if if you I, I, when when we did the heads at St George's Hall, we got to know some really really absolutely wonderful people from different walks of life who all shared a great pride in in being there. You would have met them all and and more, you know. And it's it's that pride, and they they have their knowledge and and they will enlarge your knowledge by saying, well. Did you know this? It's it's a wonderful reciprocal thing. Of course yeah. it is, and, uh, and there's things uh, in the likes of buildings, even outside of the buildings, that when I show people, yeah, they're astounded, and yeah. they go, "Wow, didn't even know that. I yeah. never even noticed that." And there are things like that, both inside and outside of buildings. That that exceptional, and that's why it's very hard for me um, to pick one particular building out. It really is, you know. You mentioned the Port of Liverpool building, and Sir Arnold Thornley who designed it. You know, we went uh, and I was the first to go up out of the uh, the tree. So yeah. when he designed it, he went to some fella who um, he, he failed in his in his attempt you know with his design to build the um anglican cathedral and yeah. he had domes everywhere on the on his cathedral on his design big domes and uh he said to him, they're all mates you see he said, do you mind if i uh, borrow that dome and he went no, it'd be great, <laughs> you know, at least I've had something up there. So that big dome that you see in the middle of uh, the Port of Liverpool building is the design of another architect that was borrowed off uh, Arnold Thornley to build it. That's absolutely fascinating story, that, and I love it. And I, 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 Lainey and I, years ago, um, shortly after we, we first met, you think we we got to see the model of uh, what the the, the the cathedral was going to look like, or suggested model of, of what it was going to be like, and that was all inspiring. But it's it's like we talked before. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm we're talking about music. We're talking about the great classical. I think of beauty. Uh, and I think it's Tennyson who, who coined the words, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. So yeah. whether it be architectural or or musically, we take a little bit and it becomes something else equally mm-hmm. as 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 beautiful as you just described them with the with the Port of Liverpool. But uh, that's just well, it is, you know, you've only got to look at, uh, the, the, you know, the the, the Cunard building. Now, the Cunard building was, it was designed on a, a, a an Italian palazzo, a palazzo, you know, an Italian palace. Yeah. And when you look on the outside, and I show people the outside of it, and I point things out, they go, wow, I didn't even know that. You can see it. It's incredible. Yeah. I really point them out and they go, didn't even know that, didn't even notice that. Incredible. Yeah. And even uh, even the wonderful um, Liver building. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, it's incredible when you actually look at buildings. And one of the funniest things is, if you could imagine this, and it was in the uh, Second World War, right? And when the Americans came over, you know, the boys, you know, they came over. Yeah. And this came up with a big shiny helmet. Even Larry, and he walked off the ship 
up uh, Water Street. You know the right now the bottom the bottom of Water Street is right on the waterfront. People don't know that it carries on right down to the Mersey Water Street. So he's walking up, you know, in between the liver and the Cunard building. Right. So he's walking up there and what's in front of him is uh, the overhead railway. So he couldn't see something. <laughs> he walks underneath you know, the, uh, the, the overhead and he stops abruptly. Uh, and could you imagine that, that this fellow must have been about eight foot tall <laughs> big helmet on. And these dockers <laughs> standing by him. You know, there was a couple of soldiers as well, but these, these dockers, they were all <laughs> well, so, And it just reminded me of uh, Norman Wisdom. You know the way Norman I mean, he's getting shy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> still walking around. Well, little Norman Wisdom with <laughs> this big can. And anyway, he was looking up, and what he could see when he got past the, uh, when he got past the, you know, the overhead was our town hall. And he looked at it, and you know the the, the way the balconies jutting out. Now, yeah. what he wanted to do, this Colonel or whoever he was, he wanted to have, you know, the American army, you know, coming off the ships and doing a procession right around the town, the town saying, this is what we've got you to protect and save you, you know, big cannons and big guns and planes. You know, you, you know the planes coming along as well with the wings over like that. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he said, "You'll have to knock that down. You'll have to knock that oh, building." Oh my God! The talking that I'm behaviour. You can imagine the talking going to behave yourself. That's that town. Oh, you can't knock that down. <laughs> you know, it's just. But well, you know, that's a funny story that resonates oh, with me man. every time. You know. About this big, uh, big American soldier, you know, Colonel or whatever, you know. Ignorance, this. Buttons are not down our town, though. But it's so funny, you know, when you get these uh, wonderful stories. And, but as I said, I can't name a building as my favourite. I just can't. But what I will do next week, I'll name me 10 favorites. I'll start up me. That's fantastic. And I'll show pictures of me. Yeah. yeah. You know, I won't go in numerical order as well. I won't, you know, if you see like your first picture, oh, that must be Frank's. No, I yeah. won't go in numerical order. What, what I'll do. So I'll show my top 10. Yeah. Anthony, yeah. it's been good tonight, hasn't it? You know, with oh, Terry. It's been great, Frank. It's been really good. We've had, we've had, I mean, I, I am in my element, uh, and, and today as well with Derek and, and yourself. History, I, 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 I love, I love learning and, and music, of course, with, with Derek. And all of the, the side questions and. Yeah, yeah, the, the lovely uh, comments. And hearing about some amazing lives. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, only for the Pak Hong Chan. Only for the, you know, I wouldn't have mentioned the Chinese. Yeah. I wouldn't have yeah. mentioned. Yeah. That's wonderful. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, e e even when uh, Pat, uh, this lovely girl, Patricia, she gets older me. And, uh, you know, she said, uh, yeah, I remember you mentioning them. I said, listen, uh, I've mentioned them a few times. And even the uh, the Chinese who got killed, uh, I've mentioned them a few times, you know, in talks and things like that. I've mentioned yeah. Richard Blake uh, on the uh, shows as well yeah. in the past. So, you know, it, it, it with them reminding me, yeah. I talk about them. And yeah. Pak Hong Chan, you know, I spoke about... Uh, your wonderful people who, you know, don't forget that uh, the Chinese community pack is the first in Europe to settle in yeah. Liverpool. The first 
in your 1826 down on Nelson Street. Yeah. Or was it Pitt Street? One of them two. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I've got a message here. Me, mate, I've got to answer it. You know, man. I, must, I think it's about you. I've been fighting every week for you to stay on. And Jason wants you off, you know. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding about me. <laughs> Don't say that. What is joking? <laughs> oh, do you know what? I tell you who I've got on next week. You love this fella. I've got a tear in him. I'm tearing. You know that um, documentary he made? Scouts oh, not English. Got Scouts, him on. Not British. Scouts not English. Scouts oh, not English. No. Yeah, I love the documentary. It's a brilliant documentary. And, and you know, it, it was the it was the what he showed the Liverpool. What he showed at Liverpool, unbelievable. Yeah. And that, that's Liverpool as it should Well, it is, you know. It is uh, how it should be. But it, it, isn't it just wonderful that that's an objective voice? Yeah. And it's, it's, not, it's not us, with all due respect, and we can't be accused of, oh, are they whinging again? Because this is an objective, learned, cleverly studied um, piece of work. Which which sums up Liverpool perfectly. Yeah, and uh, I was made up when he said, um, "Good." You know, made up. You know, he, he, I was made up when uh, you agreed. You know, to me that you take part, and I said, "Yeah, you know, any time." Uh, 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 you know, to try and give out a, a true. Uh, overview of Liverpool. Absolutely. Well, I, 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 I'll leave you you to, to do that one and I'll sit in the audience with Laney and Johnny Walker and, and watch it. Oh, no, 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 Andy, please don't do that. Please, Andy. No, I didn't want to get in. in, in you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful piece of uh, no. uh, broadcasting you're going to have no because you know you, you ask appropriate questions as well I oh, don't do that please having a drop of that you know what I mean I don't want to overstay me welcome you know what I mean Jason yeah. come up with, with one of them hooks oh yeah no I, I'm the only one he gets the only I one. No, I, I, I would love to join you on that, but yeah, but I really, really do look forward to um, to 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 being part of that or, or watching this and what you talk about. Absolutely, so much so, and I, I think by now, hopefully, um, everyone in, in in the gang has has seen the the, the program you did with him. Well, the thing is, you see, it, 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 you know, in a few weeks' time, uh, I'm just going to have you on the first hour. You know, you'll be with me all the, you know, for the two hours. But in the first hour, I want you to pick a load of, uh, not a load, because it won't, it'll take like weeks, uh, you know, some portraits. But I'm not talking about the Beatles. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, the, like, I love Billy Kinsley. I'd love you to talk about why you chose him. I'd like you to talk about why you chose people that are not into us or to people and not known as the Beatles are, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, to you, they're the unknown people. Uh, yeah. I mean, to that's, you, that's to us, you know, the like the, the mere mortals of Liverpool, the, the oh, mere soldiers. My 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 idea is that we're, we're all great in our in in. A... Exactly, exactly, and I'd love you to pick about ten of them yeah. for the first hour, if you don't mind, yeah. and talk about why. Yeah, there's a there's a lady I always keeps forgetting her name. I always forget. Um, she's a doctor or a surgeon. I think Why? she's Chinese or something. Why Chinese doctor? Why that's it. what? That's it. 
I was in that stage about that. You know, the likes of me, I'm choosing it. Don't tell us now. Yeah. Don't tell us now. But if you can, uh, you know, even Jason will put the, the, the pictures up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you have to be in touch with Jason to say, what 10 out of the 100, please, you know. I, I, I'd love to show them all, but I can't. Or we can't, as you know. But te pick 10 ambiguous ones from the well-known ones. But one of them I, uh, I want you to really uh, focus on as well. He is known to us. And that's our wonderful friend, Billy Kinsley. Yeah. And I want to know why you chose him. Is that okay with you? That's absolutely. I'm honoured, Frank. I would okay. be honoured. Oh. And the heads would be honoured, I'm sure, to be on the show. Yeah, excellent stuff. So that'll be in the next few weeks. Is that all right? That's great. So I'll tell Jason when. And I'll tell Jason, you know, uh, obviously you'll be in touch with Jason or whatever. So I'll give you time, give it about three weeks, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, to think what sense, because I know it'll, it's going to be very difficult. All right, the other nine, you've got one. You've got uh, Billy Kinsley, so you've got another nine to choose, and you've got that lady, so that's eight. You've got that Chinese uh, doctor, so you've got another eight. Was she a, a nice specialist? Am I right? She was. There you go. She was, um, yeah. now, now retired, but we're still in touch. And still. Oh, oh, that's brilliant, aren't we? So yeah. you've got eight to pick. I'm trying to make it a little bit easier, but it won't be easy for you. I know that. So the other eight you pick. So we've already got Billy and we've already got that lovely lady. Is that okay? Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank Anthony, you. Thank you, you know that I love you. And I love uh, Lainey. And, love uh, and I'll see you there next week, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I've just got to uh, thank everybody who's joined us tonight. And you've been wonderful. You really have. Um, I've got to thank my sponsors, Gap Painting Services. And please, if you and there it is. Please, if you need painting doing, whether it's commercial or domestic, if you're an OHP, if you're an NHS worker, you get brilliant discounts. But even if you're, you know, you're not an NHS worker or an OHP, it's brilliant. Honestly, it's, it's, it's very reasonable. It's very reasonable. Get them in. The first class. The first class. Fully insured, fully time saved, lads. And they can actually do straight lines. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but anyway, thank you to uh, my wonderful sponsors of the Frank Carlisle Show. Thank you to uh, Jason, because without Jason, he wouldn't be a Frank Carlisle Show. I, I don't know how to set all this bloody thing up. And also, the most important people are you out there for your wonderful comments and uh, you keep the show going. You really do. I hope you've all enjoyed it tonight and I'll see you all tomorrow night on the podcast. And there we are. See, see, Jason, can you feel that thing you go? <laughs> uh, you know, so it, it's the, uh, the, the it's the football show tomorrow night. It's the football show tomorrow night. And uh, I still haven't come out when we're going to do when we're going to do the um, the film TV review. I haven't a clue because Champions League this week, isn't it? And people will be watching that. So I'll, I'll have it during the day, unfortunately. And uh, I'll look, I've got to answer this. And Pak Ung Chan, there was a blind guy at St. George's Hall, Steve Bins, yeah, he's retired, Steve, no Steve, well. And uh, thanks for the show tonight, Frank and Anthony and Jason. Good night, thank you so much. Good night, Jason, uh, thank isn't, you. Isn't that lovely? That and, is. uh, and the point is, it's you lot out there, 
who made the show. Thank you so much, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much. And I won't be swearing this time. And me. Thank you. Good night. God bless, boss. Thank you, mate. Thank you so much.